Great, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm gonna present some work that I did with J. Edward Taylor um, from UC Davis. And uh, here we are. Uh, so just as a, a background, uh, rural Mexico is the primary source of hired labor to the United States and uh, to U.S. farms. And throughout the 20th century, rural Mexico has provided a very elastic supply of farm work to the United States. So essentially, as, as farmers demand more workers, there was always a supply of workers coming from Mexico, and it was always easy to find those workers to take those jobs. And this enabled labor-intensive fruit, vegetable, and horticultural production to increase, and, and Phil has written a lot on this and uh, how that has actually directed farming in the United States. And this also discouraged labor-saving technologies because there was no need to invest in technologies as long as workers were available at uh, fairly low wages. It also created challenges to farm labor organizing. So you can imagine that farm workers had very little leverage to demand uh, changes in, in their conditions as long as there were always more workers coming from Mexico to replace them. But the question now is whether the farm labor supply is actually becoming more inelastic. Is that supply of workers actually becoming more difficult to actually bring in? Is something changing? Is, are we coming to the end of farm labor abundance? And so the reason we started looking at this question was because we started hearing more and more stories about how there were fewer workers available to US farms. And we know that economics, in economic theory, if the labor supply has actually shifted inward, we should also see a rise in wages. And in fact, we do see a rise in wages in the US. So this graph is uh, showing the percentage change in farm wages in different regions throughout the United States between 2011 and 2013. And that horizontal bar there is the change in the consumer price index. And what you see here is that in nearly every region of the United States, farm wages rose by more than the CPI, and in some regions, by quite a bit more than the CPI. So we see farm wages rising in the United States, which is indicative that maybe there is an inward shift of the, of the farm labor supply. And we don't actually have wage data from Mexico, but we hear stories that wages are rising in Mexico as well. Uh, this, these are just some articles that were uh, in the newspapers about a year ago. Baja, Mexico, there were farm labor strikes. Workers uh, refused to work for over two weeks. Uh, and in the end, there were concessions that were increased their wages quite a bit and brought them more benefits. And that's one of the first times we've really seen that happen in Mexico. And for workers to have this kind of leverage uh, to actually increase their wages must mean that there weren't other workers to come replace them as they had these strikes. So we see evidence of farm wages rising in both Mexico and the United States. And so we're wondering what, what is going on here? Uh, Mexico is the major supplier of labor to the United States. Only 2% of Californian farm workers are born in the U.S., but Mexico is going through this interesting transition because Guatemala is supplying farm workers to Mexico at the same time that Mexico is exporting workers to the United States. So it's in this strange transitional period where it's both an importer of farm workers while it's an exporter of farm workers. And what exactly is going on? So, so one of the theories, as we look back at, at economic theory of development, as economies develop, as the per capita income rises, we see more and more workers leave the farm. And so we wonder, is this happening in Mexico right now? So this graph, on the far left, we have the vertical axis is the share of the country working in agriculture. And along the horizontal axis, we have the per capita GDP. So what we see is that as the per capita GDP rises just a little bit, we see that more and more people leave the farm workforce. So each of these arrows represents a country. And the origin of the arrow is where the country was uh, in 1990. And the point of the arrow is where the country was in 2005. So what you notice here is that nearly every arrow in this graph is downward sloping. So as per capita income rises, people leave the farm work. And what you ought to also notice is that these arrows are very steep. Just a small rise in the per capita income, and many people leave the farm workforce. And it's not until nearly everyone has transitioned out of farm work that we start to see these, these arrows become less steep. So this graph on the right just isolates three countries from here. We see China is at the beginning of this stage. We see it has a very steep arrow. Most of the, the population still works in agriculture. 
Mexico's a little bit further along in this transition, and in the United States, nearly the entire population has, has transitioned out of farm work already. So what is going on in Mexico, and what does this mean? So as people leave farm work, uh, that means that the agriculture has to become more productive. So the workforce starts leaving farm work, there tends to be more investment in mechanization, we see workers become more productive. We see that happening in Mexico as well. So the agricultural GDP in Mexico is rising. Mexico is producing more agricultural products. At the same time, the farm workforce in Mexico is decreasing. This means that the average uh, GDP per worker, productivity per worker, is rising. So we see workers becoming more productive in Mexico as we see fewer workers in agriculture. And so, but the question is, is really, how much is, is Mexico really leaving agricultural work? Are they leaving agricultural work overall, even though they're exporting workers to the United States? And so that's what we wanted to really investigate, and that's what we do, using household survey data that was representative, nationally representative of rural Mexico. So we used a, a, a data set called NRUM. This data set uh, interviews households in 80 communities in Mexico. It is nationally representative of rural Mexico. It interviewed households in 2002, 2007, and 2010. And it asked where every member of the household worked every year going back to 1980. So from 1980 until 2010, it's 31 years, I know where every member of the household worked, whether in the United States or in Mexico, agriculture or non-agriculture. And so I can use these data to actually measure a trend in the probability of working in agriculture between 1980 and 2010. So here is just a, a snapshot of the data, what we see in these, these households. This uh, table on the top is just isolating individuals at age 20 that were born before 1980. So a little bit of the older generation there. And you can see that about 32% of them worked in agriculture at age 20. The child to adult ratio in the household was 40%. Uh, years of education was about seven. If we look at younger individuals from younger generations, uh, age 20, those that were born after 1979, so 1980 and, and later, we see that the probability, the share of them working in agriculture is much less. It's only 24%. The child to adult ratio in the household is much less. You can see the birth rates declining. And years of education is rising. It's 8.6, or almost the completion of, of lower secondary school in Mexico. So there we have a snapshot. And then we want to know, what, what can we really identify a trend in the probability of working in agriculture? And so we did a, an analysis here. I won't go into too many details of the analysis. Essentially what we were doing is we're looking, we were regressing, taking an equation, fitting an equation of the probability, the percentage probability of working in agriculture on a time trend, the age of the individual since the age in this sample is changing over time. And uh, we also had some lagged variables here of whether an individual worked in agriculture in previous years since there's persistence in, in whether people work in agriculture. But the main takeaway here is this coefficient right here on the time trend. So this coefficient is highly significant. It means that the probability of working in agriculture over time is decreasing by 0.97 percentage points per year. So that shows us that indeed, the farm workforce from rural Mexico is decreasing. The sample we used was not only nationally representative of rural Mexico, but it was also regionally representative of, of rural Mexico. So we can look at all five census regions of rural Mexico. And what we find is that the probability of working in agriculture from all five of those census regions is negative. So in every region of rural Mexico, we see people leaving the farm. And we can actually graph that out. This is the expected probability of working in agriculture from each of the five census regions. And what you see here is that in some of the, the regions, like central Mexico, west central, southeast, those are the, like the red line, the green line, the blue line. Those are, people are more likely to work in agriculture. You can see in the intercept there is much higher than in the northern regions. So places like Michoacan, Oaxaca, Chiapas, that we traditionally think that, that a lot of farm workers come from, they are more likely to work in agriculture. But what you notice here is that in every single region, these lines are sloping downwards. So even in places like Chiapas and, and Michoacan, people are leaving agriculture. Those, that probability of working in agriculture, the expected share of workers in agriculture, is declining. So key findings, just summing up, we find that the probability of working in agriculture from rural Mexico is decreasing by almost 1% per year, 0.97 percentage points. 
If we scale that up by the population of rural Mexico in 2010, that means that over 150,000 people are leaving agriculture every year. So that means that the United States and Mexico are now competing for this diminishing farm labor supply. This is the overall share of, of individuals working in agriculture. In the United States and Mexico, we have agriculture growing. They're both competing for those, those workers. So the next thing we really wanted to know is, is what is actually impacting this downward trend? And are they factors that might reverse, or are they factors that we don't see, see taking a turn? So one of the factors that we suspect might be impacting the probability of working in agriculture is the birth rate, which has been decreasing in Mexico. So this is just a graph of the birth rate. Uh, it used to be somewhere around eight uh, children per woman, um, but it's decreased to, to nearly the same as the United States. So as Mexico has been developing, the birth rate has been decreasing. We also see that growing non-farm economy in Mexico. This is the, the non-farm GDP. We saw that it was rising quite steadily. It took a big dip during the recession, but we can see that it's already started to rebound pretty well since then. And then there, finally, there's constructing schools. So Mexico, the federal government, has invested very steadily in, in building secondary schools in more remote locations in the past few decades. So this graph is just the, the share of, of working age population that had a secondary school in their village when they were school age, when they were 12. That's when, when children begin secondary school in, in Mexico. And you can see that the number of children that actually had access to a local secondary has risen. So as those schools are built, more kids go to school, they start to think about other jobs. So those are some factors that we thought might impact the probability of working in agriculture. This is graphing out several factors that, that might be influential in, uh, in the probability of working in agriculture. I'm just going to skip over this a little bit and go straight to what those factors are and, and how they actually impact the probability of working in agriculture, or the share of the workforce in, the, in agriculture. So the first one is US farm wages. US farm wages have risen. This is uh, using data from 1990 to 2010, since I, I only had explanatory variables from 1990 to 2010. As the U.S. farm wages rise, the share of workers in agriculture, the number of workers in agriculture, has a positive impact on the number of workers, which is not surprising. More, higher wages, more people work in agriculture. See that Border Patrol actually has an, a positive impact on the number of individuals working in agriculture. This might be a little bit surprising. It seems that as the Border Patrol rises, more agents are actually on the border then more people work in agriculture, but this doesn't mean that they're working in U.S. agriculture. It might be that, or probably is, <laughs> that some individuals who would otherwise come to the United States and seek non-farm jobs uh, have to remain in Mexico, and they work in agriculture as an alternative. This green line is all the things that, that we can't really measure. There's a number of factors impacting this population we can't even identify. So this includes age, gender, and all of the unknown factors that are impacting who works in agriculture. Uh, this is the impact of changing birth rates. Uh, this is after controlling for the households, so we're only looking at variation within households, comparing individuals within the households. Once we do that, we see very little impact of the, the changing birth rates in Mexico. But we do find that rising education in Mexico significantly decreases the probability of working in agriculture. So you can see that now we had all these positive factors. Now we're starting to look at some factors that are actually drawing individuals out of agriculture. So we have rising education, the Mexico-US exchange rate. <clears throat> as the Mexican peso becomes stronger, fewer people are working in agriculture. And then we see that Mexican service employment Industrial employment are all drawing individuals out of agriculture. They're finding other opportunities. And finally, we can sum up all of these factors. If we take all of these dashed and dotted lines and add them up, we find the overall trend, which we can see is quite negative. So that is the changing workforce and the factors that are contributing to it. So what does this mean for US agriculture in the long run? So historically, the United States has depended on this very elastic supply of immigrant workers for agriculture. But that means that immigration policy is not a solution because workers don't want to work in agriculture from Mexico anymore. We're seeing that overall supply of workers declining. So what, what does that mean in the long run? So the US farmers have three potential options. So the first option, to find workers from another country or region. Another option is to reduce the production of labor-intensive crops. <laughs> 
And finally, you have the option of investing in labor saving technologies and more efficient labor management practices. So the first option, to look for workers from another country, this is a really limited option. If we think about looking further south in Central America, the rural population of Central America is smaller than the rural population of Mexico. So it's a really limited supply of workers that could come from Central America. And we already know Mexico's importing workers from Guatemala at the same time that it's exporting workers to the United States. So the United States would have to also compete with other countries for that limited supply of workers. And then logistically, as we think of looking for workers from further, further away, we have to think about how we actually implement immigration policies to bring those workers in. This photo uh, is immigrants coming up from Central America on the trains, talking to a few of these workers. None of them were uh, actually planning on working in agriculture. Many of them were planning on staying in Mexico. But, and obviously that's not a, a representative sample, but it is important to think about. Even as we look for immigrants from other parts of the world, are they actually willing to work in agriculture? And are those countries transitioning out of agricultural work the same way that Mexico is. So another option is to think about changing the crop mix. So obviously, fruits like peaches, very hard to mechanize. So could we transition away from these highly labor-intensive crops? But at the same time, there's a growing demand for locally produced, hand-picked peaches and other products like these. So how inelastic is that demand? How much are individuals willing to pay for a product that is grown locally and hand-picked. And so depending on how much someone's willing to pay, we probably won't see a huge change in the crop mix. And then the final option is to think about mechanization. So uh, as Phil mentioned, there has already been a lot of mechanization in the, the vineyard industry. This was, uh, and he talked also about raisins and how much those have mechanized. This was an article just last year in NPR. We have the, had the dry on the vine technology for many years. Now we're starting to develop technologies for grapes. You don't even have to cut the canes. They just dry on the vines without even cutting the canes, which reduces the labor, demands even more. And so what other options are there for, for actually new technologies and mechanization? In the strawberry industry, we have seen people, um, working engineers working on robots to actually robotically harvest the strawberries. And how much would that reduce the labor demand as well? So there's options, but it requires new investments. So what actually happens when we see the industry mechanized? Well, we can look at the, the shake and catch machines that um, work for nuts and um, certain fruits. Machines actually surround the trunk of the tree, shake the fruit and the nuts out into a catching frame. These reduce the, the number of workers that need to be employed and also changes the skill levels. So most of the workers that actually replace workers when these shake and catch machines are introduced. They're usually replaced low-skilled workers with more skilled workers, some with high school diplomas and sometimes even some college. And most of these operators also speak English and have some mechanical skills. And some of them are ex-pickers, some of them are recruited from that same share of workers, but many of them are coming from an entirely different pool of, of the labor supply. So it's a different workforce, usually more educated, this means that agricultural investments will also have to change. So we need to think more about what this new workforce looks like, what production looks like. So we have to adjust to a future with fewer workers. There are many advocates of the, the labor market. Uh, we think back to the tomato harvester. When it was constructed, there was a huge lawsuit against UC Davis for actually investing public dollars in machinery that would replace workers. Well, we have to think about what's happening right now in the labor market. And the fact is that the labor market has changed. These new technologies aren't replacing workers if these workers are not willing to work in agriculture. It's rather thinking about how to make workers more productive and how to employ the workers that are actually might be interested in working in agriculture when these jobs are more attractive. So we also need to think about educating this new workforce as these jobs become more technical, more skilled, what skills are needed for that workforce and how do we prepare work people to work in, in agriculture? So the rural residents who obtain education currently and usually find some training leave the agricultural workforce. But we could also import agricultural workers from Mexico with more skills, especially as we see education rising in Mexico and education becoming more available in Mexico.
So this is increasing pressure on employees to retain their workers, make the jobs more attractive, invest in the networks. So I, an individual from Mexico is much more likely to work in agriculture if they already know someone working in, in the US agricultural sector. So investing in those networks, investing in, in who comes, who might bring their family and friends, um, higher wages, better benefits, making these jobs more attractive. And so this is good news for the, the rural communities where these workers live. There's less labor, but the labor's more productive. That means there's higher wages. As the wages rise, those workers also invest more in local businesses. So it's good for rural communities, but it also means that we need to prepare. So what about skilled farm labor migration? Uh, looking to Mexico and looking at, at how education has changed in Mexico, Mexico graduates 113,000 engineers per year, which is the twice the rate per 100,000 residents in the United States. So there is potential to find more workers from Mexico, potentially with more, more education and more technical skills. And US firms operating in Mexico often praise the technical skills of these graduates, praise their English language skills, and emphasize that Mexican agricultural education is, is more practical. So there's a lot of potential here to, to think about who the next labor supply could be and what kind of skills they might bring. And this also means that we need to think about what the, the kind of visa situation would be. Some of the foreign workers hired for these jobs are hired via the H-2A program um, and are skilled, but many are not. So, so really thinking about what kind of immigration policy would be needed for a really different labor supply. And will the expansion of skilled farm labor um, migration, will there be more uh, skilled labor migration in the future? So kind of summing up all of this, uh, this research, essentially what we were looking at is we're looking at this overall pool of farm workers, this big dark blue box at the top. So this is the workers from Mexico working in agriculture. And those that decide to work in agriculture have an option of working either for US growers or working on Mexican farms. And there's a number of intervening variables that determine whether they work on US farms or on Mexican farms, as Mexico and the United States compete for this, this farm labor supply. So these include uh, economic conditions in the United States and Mexico, how strong is the, the US dollar compared to the peso, uh, and how many jobs are available in the United States, and how many jobs are available in Mexico. It also includes US immigration policy, how difficult or expensive or risky is it to actually migrate to the United States. Uh, border violence, uh, part of that risk of actually migrating and crossing the border. Uh, weakening networks. If one fewer individual is working in the United States, that individual is potentially connected to many more workers in Mexico. So as one fewer worker comes from Mexico to the United States, their entire network is also uh, less likely to come to the United States. So this weakening networks is really a multiplier effect. And, um, as Phil mentioned, there are more workers that are staying in Mexico overall, and so those networks are weakening. Um, so all those green boxes are the intervening variables determining whether an individual who plans to work in agriculture will work in the US or in Mexico. But none of those have any impact on this overall farm labor supply. And as we just saw, there's a number of factors impacting whether an individual works in agriculture, including the fertility rates, education, and non-farm growth in Mexico. And we see that all of those factors are pulling individuals out of agricultural work, but they have nothing to do with these intervening variables that we so often, often focus on. In summary, this means that immigration policy plays a role in the farm labor supply, but it's only one of these intervening roles determining where people work. It doesn't actually impact that overall farm labor supply, which we found is decreasing. So in conclusion, we find a significant negative trend in the probability of working in agriculture over time from rural Mexico found that the probability of working in agriculture is decreasing by 0.97 percentage points per year. That's over 150,000 people transitioning out of farm work every year from rural Mexico. Uh, we found that industrial growth in Mexico is, is one of the factors. Pulling individuals out of agricultural work, they have more opportunities in other industries in Mexico as the Mexican economy continues to grow. We also find that rural education in Mexico is pulling individuals out of agriculture. As, we, as more schools are built, more kids are going to school, and that's a, a, a factor that's not going to reverse. Uh, finally, we find that U.S. farm wages, as they rise, this slows the, the transition of workers, of Mexican workers, out of agriculture, but it doesn't actually reverse the trend. So it's only a small factor in a much larger trend.
And so the best viable option for agricultural producers, as this trend out of agriculture continues, is to invest in less labor-intensive technologies and more efficient management, labor management practices to learn how to do more with fewer workers. And uh, that concludes. Thank you.